gentlemen for the next panel discussion from classrooms to board rooms the role of education and business partnerships in bridging the skills gap i would like to invite on stage mr lakshman pokhrel can we have a round of applause ladies and gentlemen ceo and principal techspy college president prashikshan dr sanjeev bansal can we have a huge round of applause dean mfs and director met business school dr tabriz ahmed sir please come on stage professor of law and founding dean molana azad national urdu university hyderabad and dr shushi dawra please ma'am come on stage assistant dean and prog program head integrated program in management chitkara business school chitkara university punjab thank you so very much friends and all those who want to abuse us accuse us and say something nasty about the delayed session i will be sharing the detail of my host with you and don't don't blame us please thank you so very much for being there uh, professor gaffney i am just starting on the note uh, on a very which you said about the tools so on a very lighter note i only say use tools not people love people not tools so perfectly right you said uh, friends i'm extremely sorry in fact i wanted to uh, be a part of this panel but since the previous session is over delayed now and uh, i mean my Uh, sincere apologies is going to be a miss for me only i mean i have given a very important uh, scheduled meeting uh, at noida i have to go back so i will be requesting now my co panelist dr tavares to moderate this session thank you so very much uh, for being so patient and uh, all the loss is mine thank you so much so thank you mr bansal for uh, starting the session i think we are in between the lunch so it will be very challenging for us all of us to engage all of you we will we'll try to be very short and very quick uh, to finish this session that uh, this is essentially talking about the uh, role of education and also the role of uh, partnership in bridging the skill gaps so we are since morning uh, we are listening about the various speakers and almost we are talking about the same thing that uh, how the way market is changing the way uh, the we require the skill gaps due to the intervention of the technology i think everybody has challenge how to try to match this gap in the uh, industry sector so therefore there should be always a kind of uh, open hand with the industry academy collaboration and to find out the skill gaps because ultimately if anybody producing uh, whether a lawyer or maybe manager or maybe engineers or doctors if they are not matching the requirement of the market we are failing in the process and only market will be testing that uh, the ground whether we are producing the right fit or not so that's why this thinking is very very important with the industry academy we will understand that the gaps because what we are running right now we are going to produce over four or five years so that's why uh, in advance understanding the market future market and then customizing the curriculum syllabus teaching patterns skill orientation is very very important we know very well that we say that uh, in 2040 after just 15 years we are going to lose 30% jobs and then again thanks to the technology we are going to create 50% more jobs so there is no uh, challenge for jobs one is challenge that who are the strong fit for the future that's why these the conference is very important to understand and discuss and find out where are the gaps and how to customize the curriculum of the universities we as a directors vice chancellors our job is that to create a ready curriculum for future and try to provide the proper skills because nobody can become all rounder in one day it require very systematic process four year five year to provide the skill gaps and maybe the ready market recorner for future so let me uh, uh, welcome my two co panelists uh, mr Lakshman Pokhrel, he is from Nepal. Uh, thank you for coming from all the way from Nepal to India. And also, uh, my you. left side is uh, Dr. Shuchi Dawra, uh, came from Chandigarh. So, we hand to both of them for joining this session. So, uh, let me first ask them quickly just to share in two minutes about your thoughts about the topic. Uh, Mr. Pokhrel, here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let's uh, share, like, when I uh, simply got the topic, uh, I directly selected this topic. So from the list of the topic, why? Because uh, 20 years back when I started my teaching career, at that time getting job or the getting the placement uh, for the graduates was not much problem. But nowadays, 
So students are graduated from the college, from the undergrad degree, graduation de graduate degrees. But it's quite tough for them to get the jobs. So we, right now, we are experiencing. And with this, I, along with my team uh, in Nepal, so we started one college, uh, uh, rightly mentioned there, Techspire College, uh, where uh, we simply want to bridge the gap between uh, this academia and the industry. The college itself is started with the involvement, direct involvement of the industry, so that student won't have any problems to get placed during their study, not after the graduation. So that was the main third we started this college almost a year back. To highlight on major points on this topic, let me focus on three things. The first one is the understanding versus performance. Classrooms simply focuses on understanding, but industry that requires, or the boardrooms that requires performance. Colleges, universities, our education system simply foster on getting the proper knowledge. But with the knowledge, student can perform at the boardrooms, a big question. Let me share you one thing. I can understand how to hit success in the cricket, how to ball well so I can take more wickets. But with understanding, can I perform? To perform, I need to go in the field, play multiple times, ball multiple times, and then only I can perform. And we ask our students at colleges and the universities that you have to perform by understanding, which is not possible. So that students need to get real industry experience to perform at the college only. The next thing that I would like to highlight is about the skills versus qualifications. The person who is qualified does not guarantee whether he or she has skills. Industry or the boardrooms requires skills, but academics that focuses on qualification. Without skills, you are not going to get the good job in the marketplace. These days, when you get any vacancy notice with a qualification of undergraduate degree, there are 90% applicants who have already completed their graduate studies. That is why the main problem behind that is the skill. So skill can be taught, learned, only with the training and development. And in that training and development, industry side must intervene, not only the academics, teacher like us, but also from the people from the industry. They have to come and guide the skills required at the boardrooms. And the third thing that I would like to highlight on this point is about the learning versus evolvement. So with the learning that happens at the classroom, and at the end of the degrees, with the certificates, we ask a student to go and, the good, get, go and get the good jobs or get placed in the better organizations, which has to be focused during their study. Continuous involvement must be required during their study, not the linear progression. Linear progression at universities and colleges simply upgrade the classrooms. But at the same time, we have to focus on continuous involvement of each and every student, which can assure to get better jobs or the placement 
in the organizations they wanted. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pokhrel, for uh, very nicely putting three points that understanding versus performance and then skill versus qualification and learning versus involvement. You mentioned very rightly that definitely that uh, we have to see that uh, what they are actually learning, they have to be able to apply. Otherwise, we, uh, what is happening, if you see the old models, they are just, we are creating copycats and once they are going to perform, they are not able to apply the knowledge what we have imparted them. So, very important point, point you have raised. And second thing you raised about the skill and qualification. So, simply what we are more academic now, if you see about the education 5.0, there will be no concept of the program, no concept of the uh, qualification, only will be uh, the kind of skills. So right now, once we see any ad, we say you must be from IEMs or IITs for NLUs or you must have the B.Tech, M.Tech or these qualifications. But in future, in 2050, as per the uh, kind of the development happening, there will be no requirement of any qualification. Only will be the skilling. You must have these 10 skills and who certified those skills, please apply. And you will be tested and will be hired and you will be performing excellently. So that's why now this is era of skills. But the real question is that how to really refine and find out what are those skills and how to ensure they are learning those skills. So now these viewers, thank you for raising very good points. Now I request my co-panelist, uh, Dr. Suchi Dora, please share your thoughts on the topic. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would rather like to start with this aspect that when we are looking at education as a higher education, what exactly we are doing on ground? So uh, when we talk about education, we do have uh, certain, uh, you can say, pointers from NEP and NCRF. So if you look at those, you will find that they are the tools in our hands through which we can bring in those programs or uh, you can say courses which are going to help our learners to get those skills. Now, how do we fill that gap? Now, when question arises, how do we fill that gap as a mentor? Do we carry that perception? Now here my focus remains that instead of having that conflict of interest with industry, we should rather focus on convergence of interest with industry. Now when we talk about convergence, how do you bring that in place so that your learners learn those things? Now I'll share a few practices that we are adopting in a business school. Obviously, we are getting into tra train the trainer modules where we are training the faculty as well. But when it comes to our learners, we are trying to bring industry to the classroom so that at the end of the day, our learners are able to get those skills. Now, th there are various ways through which we are doing this. That includes internship, obviously, that is already there. But when it comes to uh, having that glimpse of industry, and what actually it takes to be in the industry, it is important that meaningful dialogue takes place between the industry people and the learners. So we need to encourage that. How can we encourage that? We can encourage that by uh, organizing our courses in such a manner where there is experiential learning. Along with that, they have those interactions with the experts. Now we can have professors of practice. So if mentors are willing to accept this change and are themselves interacting with the corporate people, trust me, this change is very easy to bring in. And then when we talk about having those skills, hands-on trainings, having MOUs with the corporates in the different domains helps a lot. Now, we have five schools of excellence that that are working in the different domains. Now, each domain is focusing on having the MOUs with the corporates so that we can bring in the trainers and they can help our learners to learn those skills. And obviously, when we talk about the challenges, the challenge is industry people are not that comfortable to accept uh, the classroom teaching. It, it is a challenge, but then when mentors are around, it becomes easier to change the perception of learner as well as the trainers who are coming in. So this is the one way. The other ways could be uh, you just need to find out the way out. You can send your learners on field studies. They can bring in the change movement. And you, if you try to explore their minds, you will find that these young minds 
are uh, very much capable of identifying the problems and then finding solutions for that, provided you give them that platform. So now what we are doing on this? So we are uh, trying to handhold our learners to get into uh, more of patents, innovations, and if they, are, if they have any idea, uh, they can uh, work with our um, um, mentors in our incubators, and uh, they are continuously trying to uh, look into what skills are required by the industry. So now, these things might look difficult when it comes to putting up effort and time and resources. But we have seen the results there. So every student is interested in one thing or the other. But if you are willing to put in efforts, they will move forward. And they will bring in uh, wonderful results. That what we have seen uh, in practice. And also, yes, when it comes to uh, talking about green management practices, talk about patents, talk about the innovations they are bringing. Tell them to observe rather than judge. So when they start observing little things, they are able to identify those gaps. So when it comes to collaborations, they are, um, yes, they require effort and they require change in the mindset also from both the parties when it comes to uh, mentors or let's say uh, corporates. But when the meaningful dialogue is happening, trust me, corporates are more than willing to come to your campuses and ensure that they are training your learners to the level where they are going to absorb them. They might scan their skills, they might filter their skills, but at the end, it is going to pay off. So that's my humble submission in this. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thurbase, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Suchi. You have raised various questions, in fact, very relevant to the current scenario. You raised about the NEP. You know, Government of India has brought a very new model, NEP 2020, and is just trying to really link up with the orientation system. But the main challenge will happen about the first generation people joining the academic sector. So government target is that currently we have 28.5 GR, and government is planning to go to uh, at least 40 percent by 50 uh, percent by 2040. It means there will be 12.5 percent additional workforce or the student coming in the mainstream and they're mostly from first generation family. If they'll come from the first generation family, there's a lot of pressure on the uh, orientation plus the kind of the mentoring, supporting, helping them to understand the entire scenario because they will come and they'll be lost about which career they have to choice, what is their skill set, where to be. There will be a lot of the challenge of the professionalism about the uh, uh, language challenges and all. So government is very rightly saying, let us have the bilingual, trilingual model to bring them the mainstream. But the role of the kind of the academicians, the schools are very, very important to give them hand holding. So they will be trying to properly selecting the area where they can do wonders. Because any wrong matching will be a serious problem. So our job is that to properly guide them which career prospect is good for them. Second thing is that uh, to properly matching with the industry. She mentioned about the, the, uh, the, the aspect of the uh, professor of practice. But how many industry persons, how many experts will be really willing to coming to the university and passing time? I know we have hired a lot of, we have been the vice chancellor, pro vice chancellor uh, at the good universities. I know very well what is really happening. So in the name of the professor practice, some of the profile, good profile will be joining your university. Their names are on there on the website. They will come in after six months, one year time, pass two hours time, take lunch and go. Just like Andrew has been doing branding, being a private, very happy somebody came and delivered the lecture. So it's just eyewash. Actually, we require really cutting edge skill set, imparting the students. And that's why, okay, lecture is fine, but they have to go to the industry and pass some time. You know very well the cost of the seat in the university, uh, in the industry. During pandemic, lot of industry, they have lost their business. Now, the cost, I'm just sharing what the example of the Hyderabad. In Hyderabad, there's a co-working places. They are offering, if you are a small industry, you are just startup, you can hire, you cannot hire a full office. You just hire one seat, two seats, five seats. One seat cost is 16,000 rupees. If you have taken around 17, 18 uh, seats, already you are paying one lakh rupees per month, only you are just occupying the place. And if you are really uh, uh, taking some from university, 
just to come and do uh, some hand holding, some training intensive, see the cost of the university, in the industry. And what is their benefit? Uh, so uh, one way, it is also costly affair for the industry to provide proper skilling to the student. Otherwise, university you know, also require a lot of uh, support to the student going to the and getting some lot of skills. So I think the problem is that we should be very, very, uh, industry should be very open because ultimately it is their benefit. If university can produce the very relevant up to the mark, cutting is professional, only industry will be getting benefits. So I think there are a lot of uh, support is required for collaboration and other problem is regarding the universities, colleges in the rural areas. We can talk about the Hyderabad, Bangalore, Delhi, Calcutta, Bombay, it's fine. But can you understand the 70% uh, population residing in the rural areas and lot of universities, colleges, they are so from rural background, how they will attract somebody from the big cities coming and passing their time? And how the students from rural areas coming to big cities and passing their time? They cannot pay the fee of the college. How you can expect them to is, is staying one month in a big city and paying very costly price? So this is not a very easy affair. Uh, it's a very good idea about the NEP and all, but I think a lot of support required from industry, from university and from ourselves to really make it really workable. So thank you very much uh, for a very nice point you added. Also one more point, just one minute. You highlighted about the uh, IPR aspect and also uh, I was listening about you and also I was listening about the uh, Mr. G.B. Rao. He mentioned about the IPR. I being the person of IPR, I always very concerned about the quality of IPR we are producing. One of the parameters is patent per million. So I being the expert in IPR, I always go by patent per million. You know data, anybody can tell me what is the patent per million of India right now? Anybody, just guess. Patent per million of India or US, Japan, anybody? Current patent per million of uh, Japan is 889. America is just 290. India, any idea? 34.5. Thirty-four point patents per million is current of Indian IPR status and uh, Japan is still even the highest filings from China but Japan did so much research, quality research in earlier days is still they are leading the world in the patent per million data. So 889 patent per million. If you just compare, one Japanese a uh, 30 time efficient in research, innovation when one Indian. And see what happening. We are very happy, somebody publishing papers, doing doctorates, doing research projects. But what is the conversion in terms of the IPR protection, IPR grants? Because of NAC and all these things, every university is just filing patents and patents. I was seeing last week data, it was given top 10 universities filing number of patents. But see how many are granted. Filing is not the achievement. How many are granted is the achievement. And granting rate of India is very, very less. Less than 3-4% is the granting status. So my point is that we as an academician, as a director, as a vice chancellor, as deans, we have to ensure our PhDs are converted in the actual IPRs. Our projects must be given to proper IPRs. Then we are able to change the world. But best part is that at in the, if you talk about the AI, India is a top 10 in the world right now in AI patent filing. So this shows some positive sign for India because India is leading the world in the terms of AI. So thank you very much, uh, Suji, for very nice points. Now I request uh, again, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, G. Rao, that, uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Pokhrel from Nepal, that uh, can you tell me about uh, what is the status about uh, conversion of the actual research in terms of IPR or terms of the uh, property status in Nepal? Yeah, thank you. Okay, like uh, uh, regarding uh, IPR, uh, we are poorest than India. Like, uh, uh, we have laws. Uh, by the government, uh, but uh, regarding our academic curriculum, right now uh, universities are uh, keeping one chapter in each of the courses regarding IPR. So we are in the process of delivering knowledge to the people and the, or the students uh, regarding the IPR. But uh, regarding the enforcement, it's, it's uh, almost nothing. Uh, in our country. So, uh, uh, in that part. Uh, so, again, uh, learning from what's happening around the world. So, uh, but uh, recently evolved startups or the young businesses, uh, the graduates of MBAs, 
or uh, BBAs or IT program students, since they are aware about intellectual property and uh, they are, uh, their companies or the startups uh, are trying to get some kind of uh, like uh, 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 involvement in IPR activities uh, within the country. Thank you uh, very much uh, for uh, providing data about the IPR. So uh, our topic is really about the collaboration and also about the education. So uh, if you talk about collaboration, uh, there are two kind of collaboration. One, we collaborate for the university to university about uh, kind of some academic sharing or knowledge lab work and all joint work conferences. Other is industry to academia. Uh, third thing is that industry to industry about uh, the uh, merger, amalgamation, takeover, or uh, spin-offs and all. So always the big challenge of IPR is there. If any any company is doing demerger, merger, takeover, spin-off, always the IPR is a big question mark and uh, sorry to say that in India we don't have any expert right now. We have Mr. Ross sitting here uh, from the lawyer background. I'm also a lawyer in fact. Uh, why? Because right now uh, there are a lot of growth happening in IT sector. And some of the IT companies they have 99% assets in IPR. If you talk about Google, if anybody has in Google office in the US, you go, very small office. What is there? There are some machines are there, nothing. But they have 99% assets in IPR. Talk about Yahoo, Microsoft, Google, IBM, majority of assets in IPR. For example, if today any IT company want to 10% diversify or sell out, how to decide what amount of money should be paid for 10% diversification? What is the calculation? How to decide? Who is the expert? Still, we are relying on American experts in valuation of the IPRs. So if you talk about the uh, you mentioned about the incubation, very good idea about incubation. But how many university colleges are really incubating companies with support of the industry? And how many are converting successful business models? How many successful rates are there about the startups? Only 3% success rate right now. Because ultimately, if you don't have any proper model and not converting the idea in the kind of uh, implementation plus converting in IPR, you cannot have successful business model. So that's why I think we have to also be very active right now uh, about incubation process because if you talk about the, uh, the kind of uh, uh, breakthroughs, India is very, very bad condition. If you calculate the investment in the universities in the country, all the labs, uh, all the kind of the professors, chambers, books, libraries, very, very high kind of investment. But what is the outcome in terms of the research? If you go to foreign universities, the breakthroughs are happening in the universities' laboratories. In India, happening in corporate sector. At least corporates are hiring, hiring the best talent and they are able to produce breakthroughs. Do a lot of innovations. But India, what universities are doing? We are not able to produce as per the investment. So that's why I think we have to be very active about engaging all the bright students, uh, putting them in the incubation, uh, attracting the industry, coming and uh, then motivating for good business models to go and then percolate in terms of the you know, business model. This way I think we can change the world. But some privates are doing very well at least uh, because of NAC and the inspection and the ratings and all. At least they are having some offices attracting some industry, collaboration is there. And some of the at least new models are coming. And we have seen the, that uh, there are some uh, currently maximum of the billionaires are mostly from startups. Three years, five years, see, they become billionaires because they have very great ideas. But who will understand this idea is really marketable? Which idea is, can be, become a good business model? Which idea has really a great market value? We can understand. We are the professors. Our job is that to really understand the students from their projects, from their research, from their papers then we can really change the world. So I think we have enough discussion from our side. Now we want to open the floor for all of you. If anybody has any ideas, uh, any that, kind, of the, uh, uh, kind of the questions, you are most welcome. Otherwise, if anybody want to share some thoughts, so you are most welcome. I want to add something on what I experienced, uh, like uh, our final panelist, Suru, uh, Suchi. Uh, what she said is uh, the same problem I also faced in my country, like, uh, uh, to bring the industry into the classroom is quite challenge. So they are not able to uh, like uh, teach uh, inside the classroom. So let's not expect them to teach inside the classroom. What I did is simply uh, 
uh, our college is paid uh, 50% by the industry. So uh, industry, so that runs a company, so that especially focuses on tech. Uh, and uh, like we hired in that industry, in that company also, we hired, hired the people while uh, during the hiring process, we simply write in their job description, they have to facilitate the classroom as well. Not only do the programming in the laptops or make the softwares, but also they have to engage the students in the learning process. So what we offer in the college is we offer the dual curriculum. One is from the university. So for qualification, for linear progress, for understanding. And the industry curriculum is for performance is for uh, continuous involvement and for the skills. So our uh, uh, employees at industry or the company, they simply come to the college. So they work inside the college and they, have, they implement the industry curriculum with the college students. So with the six, seven months of operations, uh, implementing this dual curriculum system at college. So what we observe is almost 20% of the students are going to be in the job market after their first year, uh, first semester graduation. That we have felt. So they are now almost ready to work at the basic level of any corporates or the organizations. So in their specific domain. So that what we have practiced right now, and that is working at my country. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Pokhrel, for sharing your experience of the Nepal. Now I request uh, Sushi she has some points. Please share. Uh, I would like to share this thing that the whole idea is of how do we affect the learning curve of our learners. Now here it is important to understand where the interest of the learner is. So whether they want to join the corporate whether they want to explore their option as entrepreneurship in entrepreneurship and if they are interested in the various uh, fields why not we can give them that platform where the they can develop themselves and reach that level where they are industry relevant whether we talk about job creation or getting into jobs so yes we do have our network of alumni who are coming to the campus and who are absorbing those candidates also, which they found to be uh, capable of handling the profiles. So uh, the, the intent should be to ensure that we are providing them the platform, whether it is related to critical writing, whether it is related to creative thinking, or if you explore NCRF and NEP, you will find that they've already mentioned these courses, but now it's our responsibility how we deliver these courses. We can bring in trainers, we can bring in experts, but yes, the cost is there, but we need to understand that our main stakeholders are our students. So we need to ensure that they are getting best of the skills that we can provide so that they remain industry relevant. So that's my take on that. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Sushi, for uh, sharing experience. Now the, the floor is open for questions. Anybody, please go ahead, yes. Uh, I, I would like to fully endorse all what Dr. Suchi Dwara said because I was at the Chitkara University at their invitation on 18th of February, which is barely a week ago. And the professors of practice who are there are uh, Saurav Roy and Devyansh Juneja, both of whom uh, follow me and uh, we, they work with me and they invited me and of course your dean. And I, I think uh, she speaks from experience and Chitkara is one of the finest uh, universities I have visited uh, and they are doing all what she has talked about. So her endorsement from my side about what she speaks, these are not just theoretical propositions she is trying to advance but from experience of what the institution is actually doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Began to her. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Anybody any more? Uh, Inputs or questions, yeah, please. Yeah. Just tell about yourself and then ask the question. If you're referring to some speaker or uh, to the panel, please also mention.
so I was listening to the discussions and I come from a school, I'm heading a school which is K-12 school, uh, name is Pacific World School. My, uh, we face challenges at school level in different areas. You spoke about research skills. Now, our curriculum in school, and of course NEP 2020 comes as a breath of fresh air, but up, up until now the curriculum is such that it does not promote researching skills. And our students, when they reach uh, college level or even postgraduate level, they, they struggle to become researchers. Now, obviously, when we have such amateur researchers, that, like the skills are missing, you cannot expect a culture of innovation and hence the figure of such low patents coming from India. So, uh, the point which I would like to share is that why not start research as a subject? right from the school level so that students know what it is to search for knowledge rather than expecting knowledge to come on the table uh, you know like spoon fed uh, knowledge comes to them and the other is that uh, see sir at college level when you talk about innovation innovation is a luxury which not everyone can enjoy because we as a society we believe that optimize the work of every uh, human resource that we have. Say for example, if we have eight periods in the school, we want the teacher to work at least for four, six periods, if not uh, more. Now, under these circumstances, how can a person have the luxury to delve into research? And if at all somebody wants to do research, the kind of grants which are given us, uh, you know, the, the uh, fellowships which are given are pretty low. Uh, so I think we need to think more holistically in these areas so that we promote a culture of research. And we also encourage people to get into this field. Thank you. A big hand to her for raising very, very valid questions that uh, we are really struggling in the area of research. And also we raised the very valid point about school level. So really, if a school can do well, our job is done. If you can get bright, uh, already is happening. All the IITs, IIMs, NLUs who are getting the top quality students, their job is very, very less because they are already properly mentally prepared to do hard work, they are intelligent, they have from the, that culture, they will do wonders. But the main problem is that who are coming not from a very well-off schools, how to train them. You discuss about the model where there is no chance for research, but I may, let, let me share, there are a lot of uh, the kind of the boards. For example, uh, IB board, IGCSE board, already it, it is in their curriculum. Because I am not uh, from that background, but I am from UP board, a uh, Hindi wala. But at least my daughter is studying in the Jilunga World School. And she is in just class 10 and class 9, they have the very serious kind of research work, a group work project. They have to go to a society, they have to do some kind of the help in hinting to the poor persons. They will prepare proper reports with the photographs and they have to write the write-up they have to produce. It must be also very, very original. So she has taken something from ChatGPT. Uh, her madam has checked and she has told, this is not the uh, you know, it's a machine language, please change it. So there is a model, but thanks to the government of India, in NEP 2020, they are trying to change from class 6. So from class 6, you are supposed to provide them helping hand to go some industry, local area to understand some technical aspect and then they may be changing their mindset. So already we are moving to this, that area where the lot of support to creativity in notions are there. Other thing is that it depends on teacher to teacher. I think our job is that to encourage, motivate them to do something very creative. We have to celebrate creativity. Otherwise what happened, even the question will be by student, some tough question, teacher will shout and then he will be stopping always not to ask questions. We as a teacher, we have to motivate, encourage them to creativity. So if we can motivate them and encourage creativity, we uh, celebrate creativity, I think they can become future creative uh, the leaders and our job in university become very, very easy. If we get early ready-made, uh, the student who already came from that background. So thank you very much for a very good question you asked, relevant question. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Regarding this curriculum thing, let me add one more thing. Uh, as a teacher, like um, I also stayed almost uh, more than 10 years in teaching K-12 uh, students. Uh, we only focus on, focus on this curriculum things, okay? So whatever is given in the curriculum, we are bounded by that and because we have to complete it within the time frame, limited time frame and learning is confined within, within that. Yes. Uh, 
let's take this curriculum as a runway of airport where the plane take offs and lands the curriculum is like that and we have to start from curriculum and we can land within that curriculum but we have we can fly anywhere so that brings again the, that innovation creativity everything so let's not limit with within the curriculum within the scope of curriculum only let's go beyond that as a teacher to transform students and bridge the gap uh, of skills from classroom to the boardrooms let's not be only teaching let's be a uh, let's be transforming from one stage of students to the next stage of students thank you thank you more sharing the thoughts okay uh, so uh, the main point here is how much uh, zeal you have to ensure that your students are guided in the right manner so uh, i'm glad to share that uh, in our chitkara international school students are working on patents so the only thing is you have to encourage their creativity and that level of curiosity needs to be there and you have to show that zeal where you can uh, make sure that they feel comfortable sharing their ideas once you start doing it there is no end to it so you will find that there are students who are going to bring in innovations so that's my take on that thank you so thank you i think we are sort of time and really i am very appreciate all of you to very uh, interestingly participating in the discussion and also listening us so big hand to all of you for your patient hearing even during lunch time big hand to my fellow co panelists uh, mr lakshman pokhrel and also dr uh, suchi devra for very nicely mentioning your experience plus your points so thank you all of you and wish you all the best yeah